Today I'm doing a setup and very minor repair on a Sigma Martin acoustic that has a couple interesting problems. Taking it over to the workbench, I set it up on a foam block and a rock and roller neck rest on a block of wood. The first thing you've noticed is the nut is broken off on one side of the slot for the low E string. The customer wants a quick fix for this without replacing the nut. As you can see at the first fret, the nut slots have a ways to go before the action is ideal. There's already more nut material over the top of the strings than needed, and by the time the slots are cut to depth, salvaging this nut will be easy. You'll see what I'm talking about later in the video. Checking the action, open at the 12th fret, it's measuring 10 64ths of an inch on the low E string, and 8 64ths of an inch on the high E string. Measuring the neck relief at the 7th fret marker with a notched straight edge and a feeler gauge, we get 11 thousandths of an inch, much more relief than we need. I also see the saddle is tipping forward. This is because it's not wide enough for a snug fit in the slot. This moves the point of intonation way farther forward than it should be, and will leave most of your fretted notes sharp. One last note before diving into this job. You can measure the neck angle by putting a straight edge on the fretboard and seeing where it lines up against the bridge. Ideally, the straight edge would be going just over the top of the bridge, but as you can see here, it's quite steeper than that. The deal is, acoustic guitars are like this. Imagine this is the body, and this is the neck. The string tension wants to pull them together like this, and given enough time, it's always successful in doing so. The top lifts up, and the neck pulls forward, resulting in very high action. You can see the effect of neck angle as I move it back and forth on this Telecaster. Fairly minor changes have a major impact, significantly raising the action with just a slight increase in neck angle. The neck angle on bolt-on necks is easily adjustable with shims, but with acoustics where the fingerboard extension is glued on and the neck is glued in, angling the neck is not possible without a neck reset, which is a major and expensive repair. Understanding that the neck angle is the primary adjuster of your action, we have to understand that acoustic guitar setups are a compromise when the neck angle is not ideal. The best you can do is to get the nut and saddle as low as possible with as little neck relief as you can afford. First, I'm going to address the neck relief, then the saddle, and then the nut. Adjusting action at the nut and saddle is only appropriate once the neck relief is dialed in. The Sigma Martins use 5mm adjusters, just like regular Martins. I'll add some tension until the neck is as straight as possible. If you have to loosen a couple strings to turn the adjuster, just make sure you tune them back up before you measure the neck relief. Check the neck relief with a notched straight edge and a feeler gauge at the 7th fret marker, as mentioned earlier. When straight, even the thinnest feeler gauge will not fit under the straight edge. Just make sure that there aren't gaps under the straight edge behind the 7th fret. This indicates a back bow where there's too much tension on the truss rod and the neck is flexing backwards. Taking that 11 thousandths of relief out of the neck and getting it straight resulted in a reduction of 2 64ths of an inch on both sides. Now we're at 8 64ths on the low E and 6 64ths on the high E. Still very high, but much better already. The saddle has a good amount of height to it, with room to come down. To take the saddle out, capo the first fret, then put some velcro around the strings near the bridge. Then loosen the strings, and pull the pins out. You can see how wobbly the saddle is, way too narrow for the slot, as mentioned earlier. The best solution for this is a new saddle. I'll use a bone saddle blank from my collection, and trace the original saddle onto it to get started. After initial shaping on the spindle sander, it's onto the process of installing the saddle, testing the action, removing it, sanding it down, and testing it again to make sure everything is perfect. Because the new saddle is lower, it has less brake angle. I'm going to slot the bridge to increase the brake angle of the strings, increasing downward force on the saddle and improving tone and sustain. Mitchell abrasive cord threaded through the bridge pin holes and flossed against the slots helps to smooth everything out. The low E string bridge pin was a little tight, so I opened that up with a tapered reamer as well. You can see the saddle is completely straight now. 
It's a solid fit in the slot with no wobble at all. The action is now at 664 on the low E and 564 on the high E. Not bad for where this guitar started, but I'm just going to take this down a little bit more, especially on the treble side. I'll load it back into my nut and saddle sander, exposing less of the bass side and more of the treble side, so the treble side will be sanded down more. Sanding it down and making sure it's level, it goes back into the guitar. Plenty of break angle on the bass side, but it's cutting it pretty close on the treble side, even after slotting the bridge pin holes. I don't want to go any lower than this. The action is a little more comfortable now. It might not look like much, it barely a 64th of an inch lower on the treble side, but it makes a noticeable difference in feel. Now that the neck relief and saddle are good to go, we can work on the nut. These slots are still measuring high, so I'm going to take them down. Once they're at a reasonable height, which I test by feel and eye, I'm going to loosen the strings so I can knock the nut out. The customer doesn't want a new nut, so I'm going to do what I can to salvage this one. I use this special flattened pencil that lays flat against the frets to mark the nut. This will give me a line to sand to. Then I use a piece of maple and a hammer to give it a sharp blow. Usually, the nut will come right out. Now, before continuing, Notice that the strings are completely clear of the fretboard. This is a very opportune time to clean the board and the frets. I'll go over the board and the frets with 4 aught steel wool. I always use the shop vac in my other hand to make sure little bits of steel wool don't get all over the place. Then I'm going to round the fret ends just a little bit with the Gurian quarter round fret file and knock the sharp edge off the top of the bevel with a concave file. Then I flip the guitar over so I can do the other side. This is a new tool I recently bought called the Fret Polishing Tool by Luthier Cool Tools. It has a concave bottom that fits the frets perfectly. You just slip some fine grit sandpaper, in this case 2000 grit, over the tool. I personally like to use a Stumac kerfing clamp to hold it in place to make it even easier. Additionally, the sandpaper actually clears the fingerboard if the frets are tall enough, so you don't even need to tape the board or use fretboard protectors. Very cool, indeed. I finish up with some oil and wax. Fractionated coconut oil is my personal favorite, and some Renaissance wax when I'm working on rosewood fingerboards. It gives a nice feel, a nice sheen, and protects the wood from moisture. Now back to the nut. The spindle sander makes quick work of this, taking it down to the pencil line we drew earlier. Holding it in the Stumac nut and saddle vise, I'll file it down further by hand. By taking the top of the nut down, I'm not only reducing how much I have to fill the broken area, but improving the nut overall. High walls around the nut slots can cause the strings to bind and also don't look as good. I'll rebuild the broken part of the nut with baking soda and thin super glue which is the same method I use for filling nut slots that are too low. Ear curettes, or earwax removal tools, make great baking soda scoops, and sewing pins have great surface tension for holding on to the super glue until you drop it right where it needs to go. After cleaning up excess material and shaping and profiling the repair with some small files, wet sanding, and polishing with compound and a Dremel buffing bit, the nut is done. To glue it in place, a small amount of glue is all that's necessary. Here, I'm using tight bond hide glue. The repaired nut is looking sharp. A big improvement without the cost and labor of making a new nut from scratch. For the finishing touches, I'll make sure all the tuner bushings are snugged up. Then it's finally time for the last step, new strings. Once you've got all the strings on, it's important to stretch them. I grab them around the 12th fret and pull on them fairly hard, then retune them. I do this a few times to make sure all the slack is pulled out of the strings. This goes a long way in getting the strings to stay in tune. Now everything should be good to go. Let's give it a try.
the guitar plays great, and is light years ahead of where it was, and, as always, losing track of time while you're playing the guitar is the best sign that the setup is dialed in. There are a lot more nuances that go into doing a setup, including checking the frets, but in this video, I wanted to keep it simple. I hope you found it interesting to see what goes into a routine guitar setup with a couple extra bonuses. If this video got you excited to learn more about guitars and you'd like to see more content from me, let me know by clicking the like button. I really appreciate it. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video.